2007, Assembly Magazine published an interview with an electronics engineer who confidently predicted that consumers would reject a cell phone designed to be an all singing device that does everything when all that's needed is a single function. That same month, Apple introduced the iPhone. By November 2018, the company had sold more than 2.2 billion of the all singing devices. Wouldn't it be nice if manufacturers could predict the future? Wouldn't it be great to know how to allocate R&D spending on new products and processes? Today, we're going to talk about how to do just that. I'm joined this week by Dr. Olivier Devec, author of the new book, Technology Roadmapping and Development, a quantitative approach to the management of technology. Dr. Devec is the Apollo Program Professor of Astronautics and Engineering Systems at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Dr. Devec, welcome to Assembly Audible. Thank you so much, Jennifer. It's a pleasure to be here and thanks for the invitation. I'm so excited about the theme, about your book, um, to learn all about your research and your work. So let's dive right into the questions. Starting with, what is a technology roadmap and why should companies create one? So basically a technology roadmap is, it's quite simple. It's a plan for how should a company, it could also be you know, a government agency, how should a company invest in and develop technologies to ensure their future competitiveness? And that could be of a product or product line, a service, or even a mission, like a scientific mission. Um, the simplest form of a technology roadmap basically has technologies at the bottom across a timeline. And then at the top, you have your product services or missions, and they're mapped against each other so that you know when technologies need to be ready uh, in order to enable future products. And typically roadmaps extend five to 25 years in terms of the horizon that you're planning ahead. Um, and so the issue is that we need to think about technology in a functional sense. In other words, we need to ask the question, what does it actually do? What does it provide? So what's changing is the form of how the function is delivered, but the function itself is always the same. And so the issue is that the companies that went bankrupt, they were so expert and so locked in on the how of their technologies and not on the what that the technology actually delivers in terms of value. And um, some companies are able to escape this traditional S curve. So the S curve is, you know, a technology progresses slowly initially, it's just sort of immature, and then it progresses rapidly. And as it gets mature, it gets closer to the fundamental limits and it starts to slow down. You know, and every percent progress gets harder and harder to obtain. Um, so some company, many companies get locked in in their local, in their S curve, and they don't, they can't transition to the next technology, the next jump to the next S curve. And, um, but some are able to, but in order to do that, you have to be willing to disrupt and cannibalize your own products, your own cash cows. And that's a management decision. And it takes courage to do that. And a prime example is Kodak, of course, that many, I think of your listeners have heard about Kodak, Kodak, uh, made its money in its heyday with film, right? photography, film, film processing, big, big business. Uh, Kodak was also the company that first invented digital photography and got the first patents for digital photography. But their management, their management did not have the courage to cannibalize themselves by putting, putting all their resources in digital photography and phasing out film so others did it for them. So is there a company that is doing a good job at technolo technology road mapping? Yes, I think there are. Uh, and, but I'm, I'm very biased here in answering this question because um, I did take a break from MIT for a couple of years. I went to Airbus in France. So I was in France uh, 2017 and 2018, and I was responsible for creating a technology road mapping and planning uh, both process and a a team, an organization for doing that. 
And a lot of my, my what's in my book is based on the experience at Airbus. And um, yeah, it takes a lot of effort, but it, it does pay off. Uh, and I think a lot of the recent projects and plans that Airbus has uh, publicly announced related to decarbonization of aviation, you know, moving to electric flight or hydrogen-based flight, or at least moving to so-called sustainable aviation fuels. Um, a lot of those projects were planned and, and initiated uh, five years ago when we started those roadmaps. How do you um, apply the roadmap, you know, or how do you test it? You know, and then our our scheduled or written question is what can go wrong in the process of creating a technology roadmap? So I, I would say that a good technology, good technology roadmaps, um, you know, once you put the initial effort into them, um, you you can and they have a lot of substance in them. Um, I, I have 12 sections or chapters of a technology roadmap that I recommend. I have an example in the book of a roadmap. Uh, complete roadmap using solar electric aviation as an example. Um, so you can then update them. And usually it's done yearly. Uh, and you synchronize that with your budget cycle when you make big decisions. Um, so unless, you know, um, unless you make the actual R&D investment decisions with the help of your roadmaps, the roadmaps are not that useful. So you really should use them for decision making. My rule of thumb is that you should spend about 1% of your R&D budget on roadmapping and planning. And the, the analogy I would give you is if you're investing for, um, you know, just a financial investments or for your retirement into a mutual fund, you typically pay a mutual fund fee, right? Which is one to 2%. And why are you doing that? Because you want that return of your mutual fund to be better than the market average. You know, if you buy an index fund, like, you know, the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ, the fund will just replicate the, uh, you know, the market, and you'll get an average return. Most companies want to be better than average. And to do that, to achieve that, you have to spend some extra effort to making sure that the technologies you pick, the technologies you invest in, are, you go, are going to give you a differential advantage over your competitors. And so that's why I recommend spending about 1% to 2% per year on this process of planning and road mapping. Fantastic. So where will people be able to get a copy of your book? You can pre-order it on Amazon. It's also on the Barnes & Noble website. And um, it should be available at uh, online for sure. For more insights on assembling discrete parts into finished products and the people behind it all, visit our website, assemblymag.com. And be sure to subscribe to the podcast to keep up with our latest episodes. We're also on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, so we invite you to follow us there too. This has been Assembly Audible. Thanks for listening.